Welcome to an introduction to the concept of the global commoning system. This is the sprint version of the lecture. That is, it is the complete slide set, but with no additional explanations. The lecture is divided into six chapters. These are basics, structure, activity patterns, means, the distributive planning process, and consideration. Let's start with the basics. What is the global commoning system? First, we are a project team of activists with a common goal of improving the conditions for commoning. The global commoning system is a software infrastructure designed to enable complex cooperation based on voluntariness and self-organization through self-assignment. Furthermore, the global commoning system is a theory that is worked out together. So far, the essay Timeless Way of Reproduction and the text series The Global Commoning System have been published, but in German only. The text series is still incomplete. And the Global Commoning System is a way for you to become part of this movement. We need support and welcome growth. What is traditional commoning? A commons is something no one can make decisions about on their own and from which no one is excluded. For the solution of conflicts, protection of overuse, or the preservation of this commons, agreements are made. Part of these agreements can be activities that should ensure that the concerns of the participants related to the commons are permanently secured. These activities and the process of making these agreements on these commons are denoted as commoning. How should the global commoning system software infrastructure support modern commoning? First, by communicating needs to non-specific others. Second, by allowing transparency of available means and agreements made about them. Third, by carving out possible activities to satisfy needs or meet demands on the basis of locally available means. Fourth, by individual sorting of activities based on personal priorities, interests, and skills. Fifth, to enable the self-assignment to activities and cooperation between strangers. And sixth, to support communication between those involved in commoning and those affected by commoning. In conclusion, engaging in commoning to ensure one's own life should become as natural as it seems natural today to look for work or pay rent. Which brings us to the structure. The purpose of commoning is always to satisfy needs. What will now follow is the structure from a need to its satisfaction and all activities in between that are necessary or become necessary for it. A need can be understood as a problem that needs to be solved. So we have an unsatisfied need, N minus. The need is mediated. After all, it is not about needs that can be satisfied by themselves. For need satisfaction, the support of others is necessary, and then an activity must take place which can finally satisfy the need. This is the shortest course from a need to its satisfaction. To carry out the activity, means are often necessary. But what if these means are not available? In this case, we speak of a demand, M minus. This demand must be mediated again. Again, an activity has to take place to make the demand available. And finally, the means is available which is necessary to carry out the other activity. A need is always the problem, that certain means are not available, and for each activity, different means may not be available, and then new activities would again be necessary to meet the demand. We'll leave it at this one activity for now. There is a third way in which problems can arise. These are the side effects of activities. The first form of side effects are new means that arise through the execution of the activity but are not directly necessary for the satisfaction of needs which the activity strives for. That could be garbage, for example. The second form of side effects can be a change in the condition of a means, for example, a room that gets dirty, a machine that breaks, or a tool that is worn out. We are talking about a problematic condition of a means here that also has to be mediated again. There is an activity that has to be done so that we can get away from this problematic condition of means and return the means to the defined condition. The defined condition in which the means can be used again and which must be defined by those involved. So these are three examples of types of problems in the social process of reproduction that need to be resolved. 
All these three types of problems are solved by activities. The question now is, how can these activities be organized on a pure level? This brings us to activity patterns. Activity patterns are described moments of the social reproduction process that tend to recur. Every activity, and thus every activity pattern, has a description. An effect, the reason I am carrying out this activity. Most activities have demands, which are necessary to perform this activity, and some activities have side effects, which are created by the activity but are not needed for the process of need satisfaction. Let's take a closer look at that now. Let's take this farmer on her field. We isolate this activity from its environment and ask, what is the effect of this activity? Harvested rice. And then we ask, what is the demand that is necessary for it? First, a rice field, then a large basket, and then apparently also a small basket. We call the activity pattern rice harvest and add a description. Which steps have to be taken so that the effect can arise from the demand? Here we are in a bakery. Here too we isolate the activity from its environment. We ask, what is the effect? It is a preformed bread dough. The demand is flour, water, yeast, and maybe that apron. We call it making bread dough. This activity is related to the last one. We isolate it again from its environment. We ask, what is it? Baking bread. The effect is baked bread. The requirement is an oven, bread dough, a paddle, an apron, and here we have given a side effect, and that is the dirtying of the oven. This is also a recurring activity in the social reproduction process. We isolate it from its concrete context and call it eating bread, an activity that is involved in the satisfaction of a need. The demand is a knife for cutting the bread, the bread itself, and the spread that we see here. The first function of activity patterns is to share individual experience socially in order to empower others. This means that someone has experience and shares this knowledge in the form of an activity pattern. Another person can perform this activity with the appropriate qualifications and also internalize it through the execution. In the case of internalized activity patterns, we refer to abilities. The second function of activity patterns is the interlinking of individual experience to transparent social processes. We call this plans. What is a plan? We have the need of hunger, which can be satisfied by the activity of eating bread. Eating bread has three demands in the pattern we know, the knife, the bread, and the spread. And we now claim that the demand for bread is not available. We know an activity that has already been described as an activity pattern that makes this need available, and that is baking bread. Demand and result go together. The activities can therefore be linked together, and we know how this demand is met. But the activity of baking bread also has a demand, and that is a bread dough that is not available. Here too, we know an activity that of making bread dough. Result and demand are exactly the same, so they can be interlinked. But then we also have a side effect. The side effect of baking bread is the dirtying of the oven, and therefore the condition of the oven changes. The condition of means is problematic, and it takes an activity to bring the oven back to the defined condition, and that is the oven cleaning activity. So much for plans which are important to our method. Now we take a look at the means. A means is anything, tangible or intangible, that can be used in the process of satisfying needs. And which means are available, and what agreements have been made about them, are mediated by the persons who make decisions about them. Here on the Indian farm, we're looking at all the means that can be mediated. First of all, 
there is a rice field, or many rice fields. Then there are trees. We have a well, and I assume that it has water in it. We have cars, and I assume they have gas in them. We have a house. We have two storehouses, and here we also have a small basket. If you zoom in more closely, then we ask what agreements exist on these means so far. For example, who is allowed to use these means? For what purposes can the means be used? Have the means already been reserved? Are activities necessary to keep the means in the defined condition? If so, who is in charge? Are there limitations for the usage of the means? All of this has to be transparent so that we can organize ourselves on peer level of how we can meet our needs as efficiently as possible with the available means. Plans are framed by locally available means and agreements made about them. Let's take a closer look at that now. We have a need here again. Again, it is hunger. And this time, it can be satisfied with a bowl of rice. We already know the activity of rice harvesting, with the demand for the rice field and the demand for the small basket. We also need a large basket, but the large basket is not available here. But I claim that it is five kilometers away and could be picked up there. So I look around and think, okay, we have a car, we have gasoline. I am doing the activity of driving a car. To move this basket from A to B, unfortunately, it doesn't work in this example because here in calendar week thirteen, the owner said it's reserved for me. She said in week fourteen and fifteen, "Do what you want with it," and in calendar week fourteen, a group has already assigned the car for the renovation of the storehouse. That's why the car is not available to me for the time being. What I can, of course, do is go into a social process and ask this group. Could I perhaps, even though you have reserved it, still borrow the car for a short time? But if I don't want to do that, then I have to look for another activity. For example, the activity of walking. Walk from A to B, five kilometers down, get the basket, five kilometers up, and the rice harvesting activity can begin. One last thing about means: available means may be forms of private property or Can be subject to common decisions. Freedom of use is supposed to be inherited from the demands through the resulting means. We call this use left, based on the copy left method in the sphere of software. And the good thing about private property, for example, is that it enables activities when it is shared with others. But we try to approach the subject to common decisions with the activity. That it is no longer individual-specific people who decide alone, but that several people can help decide together how it can best be used. Therefore, in every private means that is used in a commoning process, there could be a private granted freedom of common use, and through commoning, opened freedom of common use. And those freedoms of common use are the scope in which a social process to set the usage of means can occur. This social process occurs between agents inside the software-supported infrastructure as well as outside of it, and because there are also agents at the outside, every plan made inside the software-supported infrastructure is a speculation. This is necessary when dealt with commons and a moment to ensure that means are subject to real needs and not to abstract plans. And that brings us to the fifth chapter. The distributed planning process. Let's start with a reminder from the beginning of this lecture: software functions, or as we refer to it, then, how can the global commoning system software infrastructure support modern commoning? First, we have the communication of needs to non-specific others. Second, the transparency of available means and agreements made about them. Third. Carving out possible activities to satisfy needs or meet demands on the basis of locally available means. Fourth, the individual sorting of activities based on personal priorities, interests, and skills. Fifth, enabling self-assignment to activities and cooperation between strangers. And sixth, 
supporting communication between those involved in commoning and those affected by commoning. But the question was, what is the distributive planning process? And the distributive planning process is exactly that, points 3 to 5, which we have simplified again. Automatic proposing of activities by the software to all participants. Sorting of these activities for the participants. Self-assignment to activities by the participants. It's a process that repeats itself over and over again. So a need is mediated. The software looks for activities that are suitable on the basis of the local environment in order to satisfy this need. There are different options that are sorted individually for the participants depending on their priorities, interests, etc. Someone from these participants can take care of that, assign themselves to an activity. Only then does it become clear what demands are necessary. So what means still have to be made available to carry out this activity? And that is again point three. The software automatically proposes activities to make these means available, which are sorted to which persons can self-assign, etc. And the distributive planning process continues until it is determined who is doing what and in which order. And the basis of how the software selects and proposes these activities is the speculative total duration of these activities. What does the speculative total duration mean? Let's break down this term as well. The unit of time duration is only one possibility as a process planning unit, but it is easy to measure or estimate and it is independent of individual judgments. It also promotes efficiency and is common to all activities. The total duration always refers to one activity, but includes the duration of this activity and all activities that are necessary for its performance or that become necessary because of its performance. In the distributed planning process, the total duration is speculative because it is unclear at the beginning to which activities the participants will assign themselves to. And a further question that may arise, voluntariness and self-assignment reduce possible negative effects of the time orientation and efficiency on people, but what about their impact on nature? With this question in mind, let's look at the impact of the side effects on the total duration. The scenario. A t-shirt is dyed red, producing pollutants. These pollutants must be removed. Left and right, we always see the same process in different ways, and you can choose one. We have here the t-shirt dyeing activity, and the side effect of this activity are pollutants. Now there's an activity called recycle pollutants, and it takes five minutes. But of course, there's also the activity of dumping pollutants into a river, which takes one minute, has the demands of a river and pollutants, and the side effect of polluted water. Considering these activities only, it is of course more efficient to dump the pollutants into the river. However, this naturally has an effect on the river. The river gets into a problematic condition, and a new activity is needed to bring the river back to the defined condition. That is the recycling of the river water. This takes about 10 minutes for the amount of toxins created from t-shirt dyeing. And if even this water purification system still has to be set up, the total duration of the activity dumping pollutants into the river is unbelievably long and simply in no way comparable to simply recycling, which itself only takes five minutes. Hence the question, is it more efficient to dump pollutants into the river than to recycle them? Not if the water quality of the river is to be maintained. As long as the desired condition of the river is defined, the unit of time within the distributed planning process does not collide with environmental preservation, etc. This brings us to the order of the proposed activities, and we refrain from side effects here, as they only make everything incredibly complicated and we don't want that for the moment. Based on locally available means, the software carves out scenarios to meet demands and ranks them according to their speculative total duration. Then the top activity of the scenario with the lowest speculative total duration is proposed to the participants in the local area. At the same time, knowledge and the availability of means 
are being inquired in order to gradually improve the conditions for commoning. And if no one assigns themselves or provides a means, the top activity of the scenario, with the second least speculative total duration, is additionally proposed. However, if someone assigns themselves, activities to meet every demand are proposed in the same way, when the demand for each activity is available, or can be made available, that participants can commit to a scenario, plan its performance, and perform the cooperation. The last chapter, the method of consideration. Consideration supports participants to self-assign to activities that match their personal priorities and interests. Therefore, participants can consider aspects of life. What does this mean? If a person A considers an aspect of life that relates to a person B and or a person C, activities aiming to fulfill the needs of person B and or person C are marked as personally relevant for person A. These considerable aspects of life can be effort that is performed for others, and this is independent of whether it is performed inside the software-supported infrastructure or in an external project, for example. Considerable aspects of life can also be circumstances, like being disabled, being a single parent, being in debt, or similar. Of course, personal relationships, like being friends, family, or similar, can be considered as being an aspect of life, too. So every aspect of life can be considered if it can be validated in a form that the considering person trusts. This is called the method of self-chosen verifications. Person A has a need and there are multiple activities to perform in order to satisfy this need. Person A claims that a specific aspect of life relates to her, which in this example is the labor situation of being unemployed. Then there is person B, who considers this aspect of life but wants a verification for it. To verify this, and possibly other aspects of life, person A becomes a member of some kind of a trust community that verifies the aspect of life but sanctions a person in some way if they are a part of the community but incorrectly stated information about themselves. Let's say person B does not trust or does not know this community, but person A also requested the verification of this aspect of life from a state institution and this institution verifies the aspect of life of being unemployed in some way, which could be used in the software infrastructure. Person B trusts the state institution, and therefore the activities for person A are marked as personally relevant for person B. This means the activities targeting the needs satisfaction of person A are marked as personally relevant for person B only if person B trusts in a verification method used by person A. To conclude, as many other moments of the software conception, consideration and the self-chosen verification are peer governance methods to become independent of central authorities and the logic of exchange while staying within the complexity of today's society. And so, to finish. Society in general is always a form of organizing activities that are necessary in order to exist as humanity. Today, the dominant form of organization of activities is wage labor. The mediation of activities takes place by a market and money. The activities must be organized in line with the market. The purpose of this organization is thus only self-determined to a limited extent. In a liberal society, money used to be necessary for organizing activities. This has changed since the development and spread of the internet. And we want to make use of the potential of the internet to help build a society that knows no other purpose than the satisfaction of human needs. And so we come to the last point. We are a small team, and we have a lot of tasks ahead of us. And if you see any meaning in what we are doing, please help us make it happen. We do not know who you are, what your abilities are, whom you know, but if something comes to your mind, please let us know. With that being said, we would also like to thank all of the people who made these icons available, which we use by the thousands. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much to the people who took these pictures and uploaded them under Creative Commons license, and thank you very much for your attention.